Okay, dear colleagues, for five days now we have been immersed in a variety of themes and in different periods of the history of linguistics. ICALS 13 is running to its end and I think all of us will keep and cherish fond memories of this event. I would like to seize the occasion to thank our Villarreal colleagues, Carlos Assonsao, Maria Elena Pessoa Santos, Gonzalo Fernandes, Rolf Kemmler, Marlene Loureiro, Rebecca Fernandes, Sonia Cuello, Susana Fontes, and Teresa Mura for the perfect, indeed impeccable organization for their cordial assistance in all matters. Thanks also to the staff of conference assistants who were very helpful in matters logistic. Sans duvida, este edificio de geusciencias ten sido nesos últimos dias para todos os participantes nossa casa portuguesa com certeza many thanks to you i now have the pleasure to introduce professor sergi wakulenko of kharkiv national pedagogical university where he teaches history of ukrainian polish grammar general linguistics and of course history of linguistics professor wakulenko has held various fellowships in austria germany france and poland and he has published extensively in the field of general linguistics and even more so in the field of the history or historiography of linguistics dealing with various themes texts figures huh? authors from different periods and most often he has dealt with problems huh, where there is a in where there is an intrinsic link or connection between linguistics philosophy of language cultural history and semiotics and in his keynote lecture of today he will deal in with the 18th century with 18th century linguistic thinking more specifically with the topic of the rationalization of semiotic or semiotic theory you have the floor thank you So I would like to say that it's indeed a great honor for me to conclude the program of these uh, outstanding ITRALS, outstanding not only uh, for its uh, scholarly content, extremely rich, but also for the truly Portuguese elegance with which it was organized. And now I'm passing to my theme. Uh, the 18th century, or the Age of Enlightenment, hasn't been devoid of attention on the part of linguistic historiography. A number of distinguished scholars, including Hans Helmut Christmann, Daniel Droax, André Robinet, James Nelson, Marie Cohen, Ulrich Ricken, uh, Sylvain Roux, Gerold Ungeheuer, Cornelis Antonia van Persen, Ulrich Hoinkes, Gerda Hassler, present here at the side shows, and Pierre Swierers, uh, our today's chairman, to name by, but a few, have addressed various aspects of the stimulating and multifaceted linguistic and semiotic theories of that period. In my present paper, I will inevitably build on their achievements and some of the things that I'm going to say already belong to the truisms of our discipline. One of these truisms is uh, that the idea of a separate science dealing with science was first advanced by the modern empiricist philosopher John Locke in the concluding chapter of his essay concerning human understanding, dealing with the division of the sciences. One of the branches in this division, the business whereof is to consider the nature of science, 
the mind make use of for the understanding of things or conveying its knowledge to others might be called, according to him, semiotique or the doctrine of science. Oxford's doctrine of science occupies indeed a place of honor in the history of the philosophy of language. However, as Eileen Ashworth has shown in her illuminating study of 1981, it hadn't appeared ex nihilo, and many of, his, uh, of its sources are to look for in the late scholastic philosophy. It is particularly important standing on this soil to point out that one of Locke's important sources was a work of Portuguese origin, namely the celebrated Coimbra commentaries on the entire dialectics of Aristotle the Stagirite, composed by the Jesuit Sebastian de Couto and first published in 1606. This book had a considerable success in the educated circles of Europe and had no less than 10 reprints in Germany, France, and Italy during the 17th century. No wonder then that Locke, in his young years, used it to teach logic to his students at Oxford University. Among other things, this book is remarkable for the fact that it contains a separate chapter entitled On Science, which opens its second volume and occupies 53 densely printed pages in the first edition. This text is considered to, to be the first really major 17th century treatise on science. Since 2001, uh, 2001, it is available in a bilingual Latin English edition realized by John Patrick Doyle, in which Cotter's original Latin takes up 73 pages of standard modern print. Cotter was not a very original thinker, but rather a talented systemizer. One of his important predecessors in Portugal was Pedro da Fonseca, uh, whose Fundamentals of Dialectics, first issued in 1564 and republished dozens of times all over Europe, contained four brief chapters that handled the question of science in a rather innovative ma manner as compared to that previous tradition. Couto uh, elaborated on Fonseca's findings to produce a well-argumented and coherent theory of science within uh, which can be boiled down, leaving aside the metaphysical and psychological aspects, to the following 11 theses. St. Augustine's definition of the sign, a thing which, besides uh, the appearance it induces in the senses, of itself makes something else known, has to be replaced by a new one, what represents something to a knowing power, embracing both sensible and spiritual signs. A sign has two respects, one to the thing signified, the other one to the knowing power, which make up together its entire formal character, belonging to its essence. Uh, that's it. Uh, among various possible divisions of science, uh, there are two crucial ones, into natural and conventional science and into formal and instrumental science. Natural science have the power to signify something uh, from their nature. Conventional science have the power to signify by benefit of someone imposing it. An instrumental sign must uh, be first known itself to lead to a knowledge of something else. A formal science, a sign need not be uh, previously known itself. The intermediate concept is simultaneously both a formal and an instrumental sign, but on different grounds. Words taken at sounds are natural signs. Taken with their signification, they are conventional signs. Words signify both concepts of things and things themselves with two different significations. Writing signifies both the things and the spoken words with different significations. By the same signification, the thing is signified uh, by the spoken word intrinsically and by the writing extrinsically. And last, uh, the signification of writing in relation to the thing is simple, in relation to the word complex. Essentially, the same doctrine, albeit with some minor modifications, is found in a series of later works by Portuguese authors that continued appearing during the 17th and uh, well into the 18th century. Among these authors, John of St. Uh, Thomas had studied with the Jesuits in Coimbra, uh, but very soon left Portugal, joined the Dominican order, and spent most of his life in Spain, tried to amend, to some degree, most of Cotus' uh, basic theses, but essentially he still remained within the framework of the same conceptual paradigm. Others followed Cotus' doctrine more rigorously, some, sometimes developing at great length its particular aspects. Thus, uh, the analysis of science grew to 112 folio pages in the monumental philosophy course by Agustin Lorenzo, published at Liège in 1688. It was, in fact, the most ample uh, semiotic treatise produced in the 17th century. 
The same tendency uh, continued in the 18th century. Uh, in Silvestre Aranya's logical disputations, the problem of science make out uh, uh, the problems of science make out uh, uh, the subject matter of the third and last part of this work, amounting to 220 pages, that is more than 40% of its uh, entire text. This development was unparalleled in any other European country um, at that epoch. Uh, Gregorio Barretto, the author of the so-called New Coimbra Logic, even had to admit, an ample treatment of science, excessively outgrown with the Portuguese professors of philosophy, does not belong um, to the scope of logic. Therefore, not to digress from it, our argument will not go beyond two sections. In Barreto's own medium-sized manual, there is a clear indication of the intention to make the exposition less intricate, uh, reasonably uh, adapting it to the needs of uh, an average student. That was also the approach typical of the authors who are categorized within the cultural and intellectual movement currently called Enlightenment. The age of reason, set on rationalizing both the modes of thinking and the modes of, uh, the modes of teaching, programmatically rejected everything that appeared to be obscure and tangled, associated it with the scholastic, scholarly, and educational tradition that had to be done away with. However, the situation was not all that straightforward. And as far as the semiotic issues are concerned, the innovators were partly relying on the achievements of their scholastic predecessors and declared opponents, having received uh, from them their own education. Thus, it is indeed natural that Stefan Meyer Oeser, in his brilliant study of the theories concerning science and their functions from the Middle Ages to the early Middle Time, brought together under one cover Fonseca, the Quimbra Commentaries, and John of St. Thomas, on the one hand, and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, Christian Wolff, and Johann Heinrich Lambert on the other hand. Uh, on the whole, however, works of this type are rather exceptional, and the communication between scholars specializing in the scholastic and early modern theories of science and language is unsatisfactory. I'm going to look uh, into the work of two authors who are reckoned, each in his own country, to a greater extent responsible for breaking with the scholastic tradition and introducing new methods of scientific investigation and instruction, namely the German Christian Wolff and the Portuguese Luis Antonio Vernet. Uh, Christian Wolff was born in the Silesian city of uh, Breslau, now Wrocław in Poland, in 1679. He studied mathematics, physics, and philosophy at the University of Vienna, and then lectured in Leipzig, Halle, uh, and in Halle, he enjoyed an enormous popularity. Due to intrigues by his endless colleagues, he was ousted from the University of Halle and moved instead to Marburg. Wolf returned to Halle in 1740 and occupied different posts at the university until his death in 1754. In the history of philosophy, Wolf has long been considered as a systemizer, simplifier, and popularizer of Leibniz's thought without any remarkable original input of his own. This evaluation of his philosophy came to be partly revised in the 1960s, when his works attracted once more the attention of scholars for their own sake. In particular, it has been observed that Wolf's semiotic theory, as compared to Leibniz's text uh, relating to that matter, is a considerably more detailed and comprehensive rebuttal of Descartes' dualistic view of language. In Wolf's uh, lifetime, most of his books had been scholarly bestsellers, repeatedly reprinted and translated into other languages. They're conveniently divided into two series, the earlier so-called German works and the later Latin works. Especially his German works are held to have been truly instrumental in definitively ousting this classic philosophy from the German universities. By contrast, the Latin works are more conventional and compatible with the scholastic tradition in their terminology and notional outfit. In particular, the influence of the famous Spanish Jesuit Francisco Suarez is noticeable in Wolf's ontology. Uh, Wolf was conscious of the fact that modern philosophers from Descartes to Leibniz held this science uh, in disregard, but his own conviction was that the commitment of the schoolman to its study was not useless. It only had to be amended by applying the genuine scientific method to it. In Wolf's opinion, the schoolman had managed to frame clear but not yet distinct notions pertaining to this discipline. Accordingly, he saw his own mission in 
continue their work and bring light to the scholastic obscurity with the help of new and appropriate definitions. Wolf theoretically dealt with the questions of science in his ontology, more cursorily in the German one, entitled Judicious Deliberation on God, the World, and the Human Soul, as well as uh, on all things in general, uh, more circumstantially in the significantly late uh, Latin one, the fundamental philosophy or ontology handled according to a scientific method and comprising the principles of all human knowledge. The practical aspects of semiotics uh, as applied to languages and linguistic communication were primarily addressed in such works uh, from the German series as logic or judicious deliberations on the powers of the human understanding and their correct use in the knowledge of truth and a circumstantial review of his own writings, which he published in German. Within the Latin series, the most important works from this point of view are the rational philosophy or logic, the empirical psychology uh, handled according to a scientific method, and uh, the rational psychology handled according to a scientific method. Wolf's definition of the notion of science is a telling example of his connection to the scholastic tradition. At his time, two definitions of science were current. The long established mind, uh, one from St. Augustine's treatise uh, Doctrina Christiana, a sign is a thing which, besides the appearance it induces in the senses of itself, makes something else known. And the newer one, uh, a sign is what represents something to a knowing power. The difference between them consists in the fact that the former comprises only material, or in the special scholastic terminology of the time, instrumental science, whereas the latter includes also spiritual or formal science, that is, images or likenesses of the external things imprinted in the human knowing powers. Wolf, as many others, did recognize only material science capable of being apprehended by the senses. Therefore, the more recent definition, accepted also by the Portuguese school from Fonseca onwards, was altogether unsatisfactory from his point of view. Neither did he take up, however, the Augustinian definition, which might have seemed to him insufficiently distinct. Uh, Wolf's own solution to that question was not advanced immediately in a definitive form, and there is an inconsistency in this respect between his German ontology and Latin ontology. In the former, his definition runs as follows. A sign of this thing from which I can infer either the presence of the, or the advent of another thing. That is, from which I uh, infer either that something is really present in a certain place, or that it has been there, or else that it will come into being there. Uh, the initial explanation refers here only to the present and to the future, while its paraphrase also includes the past. However, that was probably a sheer oversight, and this discrepancy was removed in the Latin version of the ontology. A sign is a being from which either the presence or the advent or the past occurrence of something else is inferred. In line with this disjunctive definition, the first division of science in the wolf was into demonstrative, prognosticative, and commemorative, which differ by their denotation, present, future, and past, respectively. Yet in this instance, rather, rather the definition was derived from the division than the other way around. As Couto has shown, using exactly identical Latin terms, signa demonstrativa, prognostica, and rememorativa, the division of science in question had been a commonplace among the schoolmen at least since Alexander of Hales in the 13th century. Thus, Wolf's definition of science directly stems from the scholastic philosophy and theology. It can, it can be doubted anyway whether Wolf's attempt to dispel uh, the scholastic obscurity was in this particular case really successful. Even Friedrich Christian Baumeister, a stalwart partisan of Wolf's, and a leading, a leading popularizer of his system uh, through a series of standard handbooks ubiquitous in the second half of the 18th century over large parts of Europe, while Saint involves definition of sign, felt it necessary to amend it with another one of Augustinian inspiration. A sign is the idea of a rough science, an idea of something else. The only division of science in Wolf's German ontology was into natural and arbitrary. In his Latin ontology, it, uh, it is mentioned in the second place after the division into demonstrative, prognosticative, and commemorative science. A telling detail consists here in the choice of terms. Instead of German willkürliche Zeichen, best translated into English as arbitrary, the Latin text has signa artificialia, 
or artificial signs. This had been one of the terms used uh, in the scholastic logic, and some authors, as for example the Irish Jesuit Richard Lynch, did prefer it to others. Moreover, the expression signum arbitrarium was used by Baumeister. Wolf also had it at his disposal, but he opted for another variant. It can be surmised that his decision was prompted by the fact that the status of artificial science was granted by him to the words of human language. That words are arbitrary science is, or science by institution was, of course, also a commonplace of the scholastic logic, which massively opposed the idea, often ascribed to Plato, that they can signify naturally, and aligned with Aristotle and his interpreters, who taught that they have such a power from human will. However, despite the external quasi-identity of this thesis in scholasticism and in Wolf, the latter endowed it with a uh, new programmatic purport. Instead of either enhancing the arbitrariness of the linguistic sign as a general principle or relativizing it but by invoking such phenomena as onomatopoeia and sound symbolism, the world just accepted it as a matter of fact. And at the same time, he saw in it a source of possibilities for creating uh, arbitrarily, but not fortuitously, artificial signs that would, in a way, match the things signified by them. Uh, the key notion on which Wolf's reasoning was based is that of derivative signs as opposed to primitive signs. The primitive signs, according to Wolf's definition, are those uh, that do not stem from other signs prior to them, as do primitive words in a language, not derived from other words. The derivative signs, on the contrary, stem from other signs prior to them, and do, uh, <coughs> as do derivative words that, that proceed from other words. Uh, again, the same opposition between primitive words and derivative words is equally found in the scholastic philosophy prior to Wolf. For instance, in Lynch's entire scholastic philosophy, uh, according to this author, many both primitive and derivative words have no foundation uh, whatsoever in the nature of things signified. Uh, for the primitive words, his examples are Leo. It would be difficult to find a softer sounding word. Nonetheless, it signifies a most ferocious animal. And on the other hand, salamandra. It would be difficult to find a more pompous, inflated, and sonorous word which, however, signifies a relatively small and insignificant animal, not larger in size than a lizard. Lynch's instances of derived words without any real foundation are borrowed from Plato. Their personal names, like uh, Theophilus, uh, not everybody called uh, Theophilus is indeed a lover of God. Still, there also are many words, both primitive and derivative, which have some foundation in the nature of things signified. And this foundation is determined and specific in each particular case without having any general validity. For the primitive words, such a foundation may consist either in the similarity of sound, as uh, the Latin words denoting animal cries, mugitum for that of a bull, hinitum for that of a horse, rugitum for that of a lion, balatum for that of a sheep, etc or in what is nowadays called sound symbolism, with an opposition of soft as harsh sounding words, which express the nature uh, of things signified, like mel, honey, lene, softly, lana, wool, crooks, rack, vepres, bramblebush, acre, sharply, etc. The derivative names, again borrowed from Plato, also can be well founded as uh, for example, tantalus, from the Greek adjective talantatos, superlative degree from talas, utterly wretched. Thus far, Lynch's argument contains, of course, not one iota of originality. Nonetheless, from his reflections concerning the presence of not entirely arbitrary words in the existing languages follows a proposal typically associated with the early modern philosopher's way of thinking and of handling that problem. Namely, a language can be established in which not one single word would be devoid of foundation in the things and lack a certain affinity with them. If there are many words thus composed in the languages we speak now, wherefore could there not be one comprehending solely this sort of words? Unlike Lynch, Wolf concentrated on derivative signs uh, and derivative words, which he treated not as artificial, uh, but as combined of artificial and natural. 
The former uh, having uh, the denotation from the imposer's will, the latter from the th things signified. This applies to derivative signs as substitutes of definitions and propositions. Uh, Wolf was rather explicit in uh, this respect. If the primitive signs denote features of things and if their combination produces other signs that distinctly represent these features, as sufficient for identifying the th things and distinguishing them from other things, then the derivative signs are equivalent to definitions, which constitute their signification. Similarly, if the primitive signs denote the subject's qualities and the predicate, their combination produces a derivative science of propositions equivalent to it. Wolf's examples in the ontology come from mathematics, but basically the same principles are applicable to languages, either artificial, artificial philosophical, or natural. In particular, a philosophical uh, or universal language, one of the uh, commonly acknowledged desiderata, depends on the use of this type of science. A language is called philosophical, in which words have an essential signification. Uh, words signify essentially when they are derivative signs of distinct notions, or at least of definitions. In its consummate embodiment, the philosophical language would mirror the fundamental principle of Wolf's ontology, largely modeled on that of Suarez, where the being of something is identified with the possibility of its existence, which, in the case of uh, composites, amounts to absence of contradiction between uh, the, uh, their component parts. In the same manner, the signs of the philosophical language should be combinable if they involve no mutual contradiction and non combinable if the notions signified contradict each other. The doctrine of an ideal philosophical language is of relatively late date, having appeared in Wolf's Empirical Psychology of 1738. It may be presumed that they had been prompted by Wolf's earlier practical work on improving the scientific language, which, which brought him the renown of the second architect of the German language after Luther. This aspect of Wolf's work has been analyzed by uh, Wolfgang Walter Menzel. I will only cite Wolf's theoretical justification of the procedure he used in, in coining new German terminology. I took German words in their straight meaning and looked therein for a reason of naming to produce a term. Because in this manner, my term is purely German, as I use German words in their proper meaning, and while turning them into special terms, I relate them to things in which something indicated by the word in its proper meaning can be observed. An example uh, of such uh, uh, <coughs> a term is the German name for ontology. According to Wolf, it would be laughable to calculate from Greek and thus call it Dingerlehre, doctrine of things. Instead, he proposed the expression Grundwissenschaft, fundamental science, because this discipline explains the first foundations of knowledge. This modest and realistic corpus planning program, based uh, indeed on the use of derivative science, reminds, in, uh, reminds of Lynch's idea of platonic inspiration, and that linguistic science uh, should have some affinity with the things signified. In the philosophical or scientific usage, one of the main requirements for terms is constancy in their meaning, which can be attained according to Wolf with the appropriate definitions. The distinction of nominal and real definitions was current in the scholastic philosophy. Nominal definitions were treated as explaining the meaning of the word with respect to its etymology. Real definitions as explaining uh, the nature of the thing signified. Thus, the nominal definition for album, white, was the same as endowed with whiteness, while the real definition for it was that which causes distinct vision. Wolf would not have fancied giving a nominal definition of a color. This has to do with his different conception of nominal definition, which he regarded as uh, an enumeration of some qualities by which a thing is distinguished from all other things similar to it. Thus, a nominal definition only can be given uh, of distinct notions, whereas the notions of colors, although clear, are not distinct. By contrast, real definitions, according to Wolf, show the manner through which something is possible. Accordingly, they encompass everything except the independent being. For example, it is impossible to cite any qualities that distinguish lust, delight, from other emotions, but one can show how it arises, namely, when we enjoy or at least believe to enjoy perfection. Uh, in absence of satisfactory definitions, words are prone to become uh, empty sounds with no real content. 
In this respect, Wolf's distinction between notion of sound and notion of thing is important, roughly reminiscent of Saussure's signifiant and signifié, although employed in a, uh, rough, uh, in a different context. It was, however, no invention of Wolf's either. In the scholastic philosophy, it was expressed with the help of the terms intermediate concept and ultimate concept. Fonseca had explained it quite, quite clearly. When we hear vocal sounds or read writings, which are significative by institution, two concepts are generated in us. One is the word or the writing, which can be generated even in someone who is ignorant of the language. The other is the thing signified, which uh, concept is generate, uh, uh, generated only in him who knows the meaning of the word. The first is uh, called intermediate and the second ultimate. As for the question whether words signify notions or things, Wolf seems to have opted for the first solution in his earlier German works. But in the later Latin series, he admitted both significations. Concerning the difference between written and spoken words, Wolf expressed some interesting observations of psychological nature, but disregarded the issue important to the schoolmen of how written signs relate to vocal sounds and to things. Uh, Wolf's semiotic theory included thus a number of elements which had been elaborated upon the uh, uh, had been elaborated upon in the scholastic philosophy. Following his general principles, Wolf mostly tried to redefine and something, uh, sometimes to rename them, while incorporating them into his eclectic system. Those which he considered unnecessary were simply dropped. Uh, Wolf really, uh, Wolf's really important contribution to the development of the semiotic theory was his insistence on the constitutive function of science in, uh, for the human thought, of which uh, very little is found in the scholasticism. He borrowed this idea from Leibniz and made his best to work on it. It is also one of the better studied aspects of Wolf's thought, and I gave you the references. Now we pass to, yes to Luis Antonio Vernet, a top figure of the Enlightenment in Portugal, uh, who was a younger contemporary of Wolf, whose influence in his motherland is comparable to Wolf's in Germany. He was born in Lisbon in 1713 and started first in his native city before leaving for India in search of glory in April 1729. However, he changed his mind very quickly and came back to continue his studies at the University of Evora. Uh, in August 70, uh, 1736, he went to Rome and stayed in Italy until 1741. On his return to Portugal, he became archdeacon of the Cathedral of Evora and enjoyed a high prestige in the diocese. In 1749, he definitely left for Italy and lived there in Rome and Pisa until his death in 1792. Although Vernet's international impact was much more modest, in comparison with Wolf's, it should be mentioned that most of his works were first published in Italy, followed by other editions in Portugal and in Spain. Apart from uh, Southern Europe, they were circulated in Latin America. Uh, Vernet owes his posthumous glory mainly to his early work written in Portuguese, the right method to study uh, in order to be useful to the society and the church adapted to the style and the necessities of Portugal, published anonymously into a volume in Naples uh, in 1746. As <coughs> this first edition was confiscated by the Portuguese Inquisition, which found Vernet's uh, positions inadmissible, it was followed by two semi-clandestine editions in the next years, with false data indicated on the title pages. However, uh, Vernet's uh, later major works were written in Latin. Among them, his book entitled On Matters Logical had the most notable publishing success. Antonio Alberto uh, Bagna de Andrade, uh, the author of an excellent uh, study uh, on Vernet's doctrine and his diligent bibliography, mentioned five editions of this manual. One more edition can be added to this list, which demonstrates that Vernet's influence was not confined to the south of Europe. Namely, uh, this handbook of logic was uh, published in 1766 in Vilnius, at the time part of the Polish Lithuan Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, its preface, written by Adalbert Churchotsky, uh, explains the reasons of the decision to reprint it. 
In the common opinion of the learned man, this book contains, in the clearest and briefest exposition, everything that can be desired to perfectly master logic, or the science of investigating truth in the genuine meaning of the word. Uh, in the same year, 1751, and also in Rome, were published two editions of Verne's Prolegomena to Philosophy and Theology, a book containing a rather lengthy outline of the history of philosophy from the 10th to the 18th century. His manual on matters metaphysical had three editions, whereas uh, on matters physical only one. Uh, Verne also published a practical Latin grammar written in Portuguese, uh, which enjoyed a considerable popularity having been in use well into the 19th century. What Verne had to say on science and language is concentrated by all in his manual on matters logical. Kurchotsky, uh, while recommended it to, to the pupils of the diocese and seminary in Vilnius, characterized its merits in the following way. It reveals the causes of errors and suggests remedies. It teaches how to tell apart clear and obscure, distinct and confused thoughts, how to discern the ambiguity of a notion expressed by words, and to define any certain notion, how to uncover falsity, uh, concealed under uh, the guise of truth, how to arrive at what has to be proved or demonstrated by way of legitimate uh, inference or evident chain of propositions, uh, how to distinguish the pitfalls of counterfeit eloquence and the splendors of language from the performance of reason, how to argue about different things properly and suitably. About one half of the enumerated tasks uh, do relate indeed to words as signs of mental contents. Verne himself, however, mentioned in his logic the question of science among the subject which, although zealously discussed by the schoolmen, are neither understandable in any way nor of any use. In particular, he insisted in the right method uh, to study, citing Barret too in his own support, that the overemphasis given to the science is a vice of the Portuguese. He was himself a partisan of a radical reduction of this topic in the cur curriculum. The most one can pick up from the science is the knowledge that the words serve to express the ideas of the mind and the affections of the soul, and that we communicate to others what we uh, intend and what we wish with the help of words. That the words don't evoke in the hearer the speaker's ideas uh, through some natural power, which they have uh, to the same, but because people belonging to the same nation have made such a decision. For it is certain that words which mean something in Portugal mean, mean something else in another country or do not mean anything. Uh, this is all the useful knowledge that can be picked up from the science, and it can be learned in a quarter of an hour. Everything else said about the science is a ridiculous talk, which, when squeezed in the hand, does not yield one single drop of learning. Uh, thus, the second part, uh, still, the second part of the first book of Verne's On Matters Logical, entitled On the Sign of Ideas, occupies no less than 38 pages uh, out of uh, 388, with the Portuguese certain vices seem to be hardly curable. Uh, to Verne's excuse, it can be said that uh, this portion of his manual contains indeed only a very brief survey of some traditional issues linked to the use of signs. It offers a definition of sign of Augustinian type. A sign is that which, besides its own idea, calls forth an idea of something else, and mentions only one division of signs into natural and arbitrary. Instead, it concentrates on words and their uses and abuses very much in the footsteps of Locke, whom Verne regarded as the prince of those who dealt with logic according to their free judgment and liberated it from all kind of subjugation. Today we have at our disposal an excellent comparative analysis of Locke's and Verne's ideas concerning language and communication by Amandio Augusto Cuscito. According to this author, uh, Verne advanced a dynamic theory of meaning which rejects the idea that words are simple outer expression of some pre-established meanings. To those who are interested, I recommend this well-written and enjoyable text. Instead, I will say a few words about Verne's appraisal of Wolf's idea of language. For Verne, Wolf was a big name and a truly unrivaled man. In logic, his superiority to other authors was evident in three aspects. Nobody has offered more accurate definitions of words. Nobody has detected truth with more acuteness. 
Nobody has offered clear demonstrations follow a following a method closer to mathematics. At the same time, uh, Vernet found with Wolf several grave shortcomings. Uh, he separated uh, the art of invention from logic. He came up with useless demonstrations of negligible things. He confirms his reflections with examples taken from more serious disciplines, which instead of eliciting make things obscure. Having excessively studied algebra, he borrowed a barbarous and barbarously formed words from it. Uh, he indulges in the same vice as other people to absorb in the study of mathematics. Namely, he uses a method and a language distant from the everyday usage of man, so that it seems absolutely pointless in view of achieving his own aim, uh, that is, instructing the pupils. Vernet's approaches were primarily of pedagogical nature, although they also included a linguistic component. Later on, he returned to Wolf's views touching on the basic point of divergence between the latter and himself. Namely, whereas Wolf claimed that real definitions of all things existing are in principle possible, while only things of which we have distinct ideas are susceptible of nominal definitions, for Vernet uh, the definitions were in principle only nominal because of the imperfection of human knowledge. For example, uh, Wolf had defined a clock as a machine that shows the hour by the rotation of pointers or by striking a bell. Vernet proposed a slightly different variant, an artifact that shows the hours of the day with a pointer, insisting that it is a nominal definition varying with the speaker, and thus an arbitrary one. In his opinion, there is no reason to condemn this arbitrariness, providing that the same person always uses the word in question in the same acceptation. In fact, this is a general rule, because also those who are called mathematicians define names as it pleases them. And the recent philosophers, including Wolf himself, a very careful man indeed, proposed several new definitions of names. However, Vernet disapproved of this practice. Uh, oh. However, uh, Vernet disapproved of this practice. In order not to perplex the reader, uh, it would have been more sensible to use the received definitions if they contain nothing unsuitable. In the second edition of On Matters Logical, Vernet added to this passage a long footnote explaining why Wolf's distinction of nominal and real definitions does not hold from a truly philosophical point of view. At most, one could call real the definitions commonly accepted by the scientists working in a particular field and then keep the expression nominal definitions for those which derive from an individual imposition. In short, and using modern terminology, Wolf was a believer in structural semantics based on the notion of systemic oppositions and stable distinctive feature, features, while Vernet was more inclined to regard meaning rather from a communicative and pragmatic perspective. Both tried to rationalize the semiotic theory inherited from the late scholasticism. Wolf's strategy was to integrate in his own system those of its elements which he found useful, while reinterpreting them according to his own basic principles. Vernet was set on eliminating what he deemed useless from the received doctrines in order to give a sensible and understandable account of the role of science in practical communication and cognition. The one and the other are symbolic figures for the Age of Enlightenment. The example suggests that the philosophy of language and the semiotics of that time only can be adequately evaluated against the background of late scholastic contribution to this field. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting inquiry about uh, history of logic in its relationship with uh, history of semiotics. I guess we have time for about uh, two, maybe three questions. Yes. Most of the discussion that uh, you were citing from, from Wolf in particular, sorry. Most of the discussion you were deciding from Wolf and from Vernet, uh, I'm also thinking of Ponceau, uh, always says the word, the word, the word, the word, natural signs, artificial signs. Um, in, in Wolf's work, what do you, what do you, 
doesn't he have a place for, for visual signs and the dialectic between language and other, other kinds of symbol making? Yes, of course. Uh, Wolf, uh, in the footsteps of uh, Leibniz, uh, produced this theory in which uh, the basic approach to uh, language, natural language, and to uh, artificial semiotic systems, like artificial languages, was uh, in fact the same. And uh, uh, he just believed that uh, uh, the application of these principles can be more perfect in artificial languages, but uh, to some degree, uh, at least, it is also possible in natural languages. And uh, he uh, made a great contribution to the development of German uh, as a scientific language, and many, many uh, of his coinages uh, have become indeed part and parcel of modern German. Other questions? Uh, not a question, but just a brief comment. Uh, as you say, Christian Wolf uh, was a major innovator in terms of terminology uh, to avoid just using all the Latin terms. And, you know, he came up with terms like dreieck to replace triangle and things like that. He typically, throughout his writings, would use the Antiqua uh, script to highlight the foreign words or the words that he thought were foreign. However, uh, that said, he was very inconsistent about it, uh, both in terms of the scripts, uh, the fonts that he used to highlight the foreign words, and he vacillated uh, in his own usage of those terms. So uh, he created a word such as dreieck, but in his writings, uh, you will see him go back and forth between triangle and, and dreieck. That's just one example, but I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, that's true. Uh, nobody's perfect. <laughs> I have a remark on the dreieck. Uh, Terms like that were actually invented by Simon Stefan, and they were taken over by the Germans. The Germans mentioned C uh, Simon Stefan quite often, and those terms date from the 16th century, actually, and probably because Simon Stefan was also very important for the creation of the Deutsche Kanzleisprache. And for instance, he's quoted often by Schottel. And you know, Simon Stefin invented those terms, and he says terms are the short definition of things. And so Wolf is actually influenced by Simon Stefin in that respect. Uh, yes, again, this is quite true, and uh, indeed, uh, modern research has shown that many terms traditionally ascribed to Wolf had been in use before. And uh, uh, his opponents tried to um, use this material in their uh, polemic uh, attacks against Wolf, uh, but they were not well founded, these uh, accusations, I mean, uh, because Wolf just uh, had the ability to pick up what he found in uh, the German language. And there is an interesting idea uh, that uh, uh, this had something to do with his origin, because uh, in Germany, Silesia uh, was traditionally considered as uh, the land of poets. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, well, uh, he uh, just uh, had a source of inspiration in uh, his 
small model in Silesia. But in fact, yes, uh, uh, many words uh, did exist in German, uh, and Wolf only uh, made terms out of them as he uh, wrote also in the theoretical part of his work. No further questions? Well, I think we have to thank you again for this talk. Thank you, everybody. And so we will have a brief break, so it has to clear the floor, and you can stretch your legs. Okay, thank you.